That's, this is Dr. Cook with Terrain Analysis. All right, the, our guiding documents for this come from ATP 3-21.8 and talking about military aspects of terrain. And when we do this, we wanna maintain our OACOC format. And then we're gonna talk about how we evaluate that format. The first thing you wanna do is identify, describe, or classify your terrain. Then you want to look at what are the effects of that on the enemy? What are the effects of that on yourself and your units? And then the most important part is these deductions, the so what. What does it matter that those effects are there and how do they actually impact you? What does it do to your mission to take those into account? All right, the five aspects of military terrain are something you should already know, but here is a refresher on it. We're talking about obstacles, avenues of approach, key terrain, observation and fields of fire, and cover and concealment. We're going to go ahead and walk through each of those and talk about how we think about them. All right, we have a battle book uh, that can help us lay this out with columns to write in our description of what that terrain is that impacts that area, what effects it has on the enemy and friendly, and then what deductions. And notice that that deduction part is the biggest one. That's what we need you to focus on. What does it matter? All right, obstacles, all right, these are features that are gonna disrupt, fix, turn, block your movement, get in your way. They can be broken down into your existing obstacles. So things like rivers, mountains, swamps, buildings, fences, just parts of the terrain that are already there and not anything specific because of the military operations, but they exist as part of the terrain. Second kind of obstacles is reinforcing. These are things that military forces came in and put in place to create even more of an obstacle and reinforce the terrain. All right, Constantina wire, minefields, abatis, which are down trees across the road, tank ditches, all right? Those are reinforcing obstacles. And for our obstacles, we can talk about uh, a little more refined on it. Reinforcing protective obstacles are things like this foxhole that's dug in, all right? With earthworks around them to protect them, that's its purpose versus reinforcing tactical obstacles that are meant to shape the battlefield and how the enemy moves, like this tangle foot wire that's out there. For the existing obstacles, we can break that into existing natural, so things like streams, rivers, ravines, cliffs, or existing man-made obstacles. So we can put out buildings that get in the way, uh, fences that might be built around, hedgerows that are just things that are already on the terrain for other reasons, but people put them there. All right, avenues of approach is an air or ground route of an attacking force leading to the objective or the key terrain. I got to emphasize that if it's not leading to an objective or leading to key terrain, it is not an avenue of approach. All right, here's our symbol for those, red for enemy, blue for friendly. And we can classify our avenues of approach based on type. Is it a mounted avenue of approach, a dismounted avenue of approach, is it an air avenue? You talk about the formations that can get through them. Uh, is it something we can put a battalion formation through or do I have to go through with only a squad? And we can talk about the speed of the largest unit that could move on that uh, avenue of approach. So you could have an avenue of approach that's a nice paved road and I can move really fast down that versus having to go over uh, you know, hilly terrain or through a swamp, things like that, all right? Avenues of approach are composed of mobility corridors, all right, which are little passageways that are relatively free of obstacles. Now, on the symbol for the mobility corridor, that little, those two lines in the middle there are, are a unit size designator. So that's a battalion, just like on the top of our unit icons. If it was a platoon size mobility corridor, meaning it was much more narrow, and I can only put a platoon formation through there, we'd have three dots. All right, if it was something smaller that I can only put a company at a time, uh, it'd be a single line, or if it was a squad, it would be a single dot, all right? So that part of the symbol tells you how large that corridor is and what size unit can easily move through it. A series of these mobility corridors can get put together to create an avenue of approach for your total unit uh, to get to the objective. All right, key terrain. All right, now you have to evaluate your key terrain by assessing the impact of its seizure retention on both forces, either force, all right? Part of key terrain is that whoever controls it has the advantage. 
all right, on either side. If it's only an advantage to you and it's not an advantage to the enemy, then it's not key terrain, all right? So it has to be something that both sides would benefit from having, and that's what makes it key. <clears throat> all right, things like at the Battle of Thermopylae when they had to go through the gates there, right, whichever force controlled that could control the movement and prevent others from coming through it or guarantee their own movement through it, all right? From fiction, we could talk about uh, the wall up in the north in Game of Thrones, all right? The ability to control that wall controlled who could move across it and controlling the gate's uh, limited passage, all right? For another example, we can talk about that narrow part of the river where boats had to slow down in order to navigate through, which meant that whoever controlled the high ground on either side could put gunfire and shut down traffic going from New York to Albany. All right, <clears throat> that made it key terrain. <clears throat> now, here's a kind of local map. We'll put two pieces of key terrain on there. Now, I do want to highlight that uh, K1 there, just up on a hilltop. All right, please do not label every hilltop as key terrain. The fact that something is a hilltop or high ground does not inherently make it key terrain. All right, you have to have more of a reason than that. All right, why is that high ground important to both sides or either side, all right? Whereas something like the Bear Mountain Bridge might be the better key terrain um, in the sense that if you control the bridge, you control traffic from one side of the river to the other, and you can prevent the enemy from, from doing that. And it is a long way around to go up to the other bridges, all right? Now, if your mission is to protect the bridge, the top of Bear Mountain might be key terrain because whoever controls that can put massive fires on that bridge, all right, with indirect, especially with mortar systems, indirect fires, um, things like that. So that might make a reason to say that the high ground is key terrain, uh, but it has to be able to justify that. Please do not, do not, do not just say that the hilltop is key terrain because it's a hilltop. All right, observation and fields of fire. All right, observation is how well you can see the threat, all right, visually. And that could be aided or unaided, right? So you could have, maybe you got to use binoculars or thermal vision to do that, but that's what observation is, all right? Concealment is something that can limit or get rid of your observation. <clears throat> Fields of fire is where you can put your weapon, a group of weapons uh, to place fires on the enemy, all right? where I can actually shoot other people, right? That's my fields of fire. <clears throat> Terrain that offers cover can limit your fields of fire, all right? <clears throat> so if there's some ditches and curves in the ground, uh, that might be a spot that I can't get fields of fire into, at least not with direct fire weapons. So we have some examples here on the bottom. The, uh, on the right-hand side here, we can see there's a lot of trees. It really prevents our observation. Uh, through that. Now, I might be able to get some fires through there, but without being able to see, it, it's still limiting, right? I don't have observation in there. Whereas on the left, I've got some really good observation of that path, and I probably have good ob uh, fields of fire, depending on where I'm located. If that's beyond the range of my weapons, maybe I don't have good fields of fire, right? <clears throat> the terrain that offers both good observation and good fields of fire is something that favors the defense, all right? <clears throat> so if you're looking for defending the terrain, you want to have good observation and fields of fire. If you're looking to attack a defender, it's not helpful to you and it is helpful to them if there's good observation and fields of fire from their defense. Right, let's talk about cover and concealment and make sure that we don't get these two confused, all right? Cover is protection from the actual weapons fire, all right? That's what cover is. It will stop bullets. We're talking about ditches, caves, river banks with dirt there that I get behind, walls, as long as they're substantial enough to stop bullets, buildings, things like that, that will stop incoming rounds from getting through. And as much as these adobe, you know, wood, um, straw and earth structures seem, you know, insignificant to us. They provide much more cover than our sheetrock and wood framed buildings do, all right? It is dirt. They are basically sandbags without the bag, all right? <clears throat> Concealment 
is protection from observation. Right? Concealment has to do with you not being seen. You can talk about vegetation, tall grass, snow drifts. These are all things that give you concealment. You can hide in them, but if somebody tried to shoot at you, you're going to get shot. All right? It won't stop bullets. All right, so that's our overview on going through OACOC and terrain analysis. So I hope you learned something, and we will see you in class.